Chapter 21, The New Deal, 1932 to 1940, Part 3 and 4. The belief that a lack of consumer demand caused the Depression had become popularized by Long, Townsend, and the CIO. By 1935, many New Dealers believed government should no longer try to stimulate business recovery, but should redistribute income in order to sustain mass purchasing power in the consumer economy. Congress imposed a tax on large fortunes and corporate profits and created the Rural Electrification Agency, the REA, to bring electricity to homes, thus enabling rural Americans to purchase household appliances. The REA brought electricity to millions of homes and was one of the most successful New Deal programs. The federal government also tried to promote soil conservation and family farming, as policymakers believed that prosperity was impossible when farmers' standard of living lagged behind that of urban workers and the middle class. In 1934, FDR had limited federal employment programs, but now he established a Works Progress Administration, or WPA, which hired 3 million Americans each year until it ended in 1943. Directed by Harry Hopkins, the WPA transformed the American landscape. It built thousands of public bri buildings, bridges, roads, airports, stadiums, swimming pools, and sewage treatment plants. The WPA even employed white-collar professionals. The most famous WPA projects were in the arts and included murals, historical, and tourist guidebooks, and also in federal theater and dance projects. In 1935, Congress also created a National Youth Administration to provide relief to American teenagers and young adults. The Wagner Act was another major Second New Deal measure. It democratized the American workplace by empowering the National Labor Relations Board to supervise elections in which employees voted on union representation. Sponsored by Robert Wagner of New York, the bill also made illegal unfair labor practices such as firing and blacklisting union organizers that had stymied organization in the past. Collective bargaining was redefined as a crucial element of American freedom and now legally protected would offer workers a mechanism by which they could win higher wages and thus contribute to the recovery. The Social Security Act was the most important element of the Second New Deal. It represented Roosevelt's belief that the government had to guarantee the material well-being of ordinary Americans. It established a system of unemployment insurance, old age pensions, and aid to the disabled, elderly poor, and families with dependent children. Though these programs were built on old progressive proposals, this was a permanent system of social insurance. The Social Security Act created the American version of the welfare state, a term with origins in World War II era Britain that referred to income assistance, medical care, and social services for all citizens. Although unprecedented in American history, the American welfare state, compared to welfare states in Europe, was more decentralized, spent less, and covered fewer citizens. The original Social Security Bill contained a system of national health insurance that was eliminated after vehement opposition by the American Medical Association, which feared government regulation of doctors' incomes and practices. While some new dealers wanted a universal program funded by general tax revenues with a single set of eligibility standards administered by federal officials, Secretary of Labor Francis Perkins and powerful congressmen wanted to keep relief in state and local hands and make workers contribute to the costs of their own benefits. FDR wanted Social Security taxes to come from employers and workers rather than general revenues in order to give working citizens a legal, moral, and political right to collect their old age pensions and unemployment benefits, which Congress would not dare violate. Thus, Social Security became a mixture of national and local funding, control, and eligibility standards. Old age pensions were administered nationally, but paid for by taxes on workers and employers. These taxes also paid for unemployment insurance, but this was decentralized, allowing states to set unemployment benefit levels. The states paid most of the cost for direct poor relief in a program called Aid to Dependent Children, and eligibility and payment varied greatly. Social Security was a significant departure in American government's traditional function, and the Second New Deal dramatically changed the relationship between the federal government and American citizens. Before the 1930s, Americans asked whether the government should intervene in the economy. After the New Deal, Americans asked only how the government should intervene. The Depression ensured that Americans would face, in the words of one writer, a reckoning with liberty. FDR declared that for too many Americans, life was no longer free, liberty no longer real, men no longer follow the pursuit of happiness. Most Americans assumed that liberty required a new meaning. 
The New Deal transformed the idea of freedom by tying it to the growing power of the national government. Roosevelt was not just a master politician, but also a brilliant communicator, and when his opponent controlling most newspapers, he turned to the radio to reach Americans with weekly broadcasts called Fireside Chats in order to build support for his policies. FDR adopted old terms and ideas to defend his innovative policies, most notably liberalism, which he redefined as large, active, and socially conscious government. In his second fireside chat, Roosevelt contrasted the older notion of liberty as liberty of contract, which served the privileged few, to his definition of liberty as greater security for the average man. He continued to positively associate freedom with economic security and identify economic inequality as its greatest foe. Yet, liberty, defined as freedom from powerful government, animated his opponents. They argued that New Deal spending undermined fiscal responsibility and that new regulations suppressed American freedom. Conservative businessmen and politicians formed an organization to oppose his policies called the American Liberty League. As the 1930s went on, his opponents increasingly employed the language of liberty to paint FDR as a dictator who threatened traditional American freedoms. By 1936, politics reflected class divisions more than at any other point in American history. Working class voters provided a large majority for the Democratic Party, and large and small businessmen were alienated from the New Deal. Americans divided over their definitions of liberty. One magazine editor said that citizens had two opposing concepts of liberty. One based on free enterprise, the other a socialized liberty based on equality of wealth and goods. A fight over this ideal of freedom defined the 1936 presidential campaign. The Democrats insisted that in a modern economy the government is obliged to guarantee a democracy of opportunity for all. Roosevelt, in his speech accepting the nomination, attacked economic royalists who intended to establish a tyranny over ordinary people. He insisted that economic rights were the precondition for liberty and that poor men are not free men. FDR argued that large corporations constituted a new despotism that threatened economic freedom. FDR faced Republican nominee and former Kansas governor Alfred Landon, who denounced Social Security and other New Deal programs as a threat to individual liberty. Roosevelt, however, won by a landslide, carrying every state except for Maine and Vermont. Strong support from organized labor and his ability to unite southern white and northern black voters, Protestant farmers and urban Catholic and Jewish ethnics, and industrial workers and middle class homeowners won him the election. These groups formed the so-called New Deal Coalition that dominated American politics for the next 50 years. At his inauguration, FDR admitted the Depression was not over and promised to do more to help the significant minority of Americans still in need of assistance. Encouraged by his massive victory, Roosevelt committed what many believe was an enormous error. Arguing that several Supreme Court justices were too old to perform their functions, he proposed that the President be allowed to appoint a new justice for each who remained on the court past age 70, which were six at the time. FDR's goal was to change the balance of power on a court that might invalidate Social Security, the Wagner Act, and other parts of the Second New Deal. Immediately, FDR was criticized as an aspiring dictator. Congress rejected the plan, but Roosevelt influenced the Supreme Court as the court packing threat seemed to persuade the court to accept economic regulation by the state and federal governments. The court soon upheld a minimum wage law, affirmed federal power to regulate wages, hours, child labor, and rejected challenges to Social Security and the Wagner Act. Chief Justice Charles Evan Hughes said that while freedom of contract did not appear in the Constitution, liberty did, and it required legal protections against social evils that menace the people's welfare. The second New Deal slowed after the court packing fight, Although the Housing Act passed in 1937 signaled the first major effort to build homes for the poorest in America, the Fair Labor Standards Bill languished in Congress for a year before it passed in 1938, banning goods produced by child labor, setting a minimum wage, and requiring overtime pay for more than 40 hours of work per week. This established federal regulation of wages and working conditions, a radical departure from pre-depression policies. In 1937, the economy slumped sharply after FDR, who saw economic improvements in 1936, had decreased federal farm and WPA work relief. This caused business investment, production, and stocks to also fall and unemployment to rise. 
In 1936, in the general theory of employment, interest, and money, John Maynard Keynes criticized economists' commitment to balanced budgets. He argued that massive government spending was needed, even at the cost of deficits, to sustain purchasing power and stimulate economic activity during downturns. By 1938, Roosevelt adopted this solution. Known as Keynesian economics, and he asked Congress for billions for more work relief and farm aid. The New Deal had shifted from economic planning to economic redistribution to public spending. The Second New Deal was over. Chapter 21, Part 4 Roosevelt conceived of the Second New Deal's assistant to broad groups of needy Americans, the unemployed, elderly, and dependent, as a right of citizenship, not a special privilege. But the realities of inherited ideas about gender and black disenfranchisement in the South powerfully affected legislation. The New Deal affected different groups of Americans in very different ways. The New Deal incorporated women into government more than any previous administration. A number of talented women, such as Secretary of Labor France Perkins, advised the president and affected policy. Most well-known was Eleanor Roosevelt, who became the first modern first lady, using her position for the reform in civil rights, labor laws, and work relief. But organized feminism was absent in the 1930s. The Depression actually provoked calls for women to leave the labor market in order to open up jobs for unemployed men. The federal government enacted laws that led to the dismissal of female government employees, and many private employers prohibited married women from jobs. Even the CIO, which organized female workers, adhered to the notion that women should be supported by men. The ideal of the male head household powerfully shaped social policy. Because paying taxes on wages made one eligible for the most generous social security programs, old age pensions, and unemployment insurance, they did not cover most women because they did not work outside of the home. The program excluded the three million mostly female domestic workers. Although Roosevelt strived to portray the federal government as representing all people in America, the power of the solid South molded the New Deal welfare state into an entitlement of white Americans. With black disenfranchisement, Democrats controlled the South. Southern Democratic members of Congress were elected again and again by tiny white electorates. Because committee chairmanships rested on seniority, Southerners, once the Democrats took control of Congress in 1933, took the key leadership positions. Roosevelt believed he could not challenge the Southern Democrats if he wanted New Deal laws passed. Southern Democrats excluded from Social Security agricultural and domestic workers, the largest categories of black employment. Only black organizations and the left pushed for truly universal social insurance. Congressman Ernest Lundeen in Minnesota in 1935 had introduced a bill to create a federal system of old age unemployment and health benefits for all wage workers and support for female heads of households with dependents, but it was replaced by the Social Security Bill. Because of this Southern veto, most black workers were limited to the least generous and most vulnerable parts of the new welfare state. Direct public assistance programs were ostensibly open to all poor seniors and families with dependent children who demonstrated financial need, but benefits were set low and eligibility was determined by state and local officials who had broad authority. In the South, this translated into widespread discrimination. Because recipients of direct assistance did not pay social security taxes, they soon bore a stigma of dependency on government handouts, which would become known simply as welfare. The stigma intensified until pressure for reform led the federal government to abolish its responsibility for welfare in 1996 during the Bill Clinton administration. The Depression and New Deal had a contradictory impact on the nation's racial minorities. Commissioner of Indian Affairs John Collier launched an Indian New Deal, ending the policy of coerced assimilation and granting unprecedented cultural autonomy. He replaced boarding schools with reservation schools and increased spending on Indian health. He also ended the policy implemented since the Dawes Act of dividing Indian lands into small individual family plots and selling off the rest. Federal officials now recognized the right of Indians to govern their own communities, except in areas covered by federal law. Though the New Deal was the most radical shift in Indian policy in American history, it barely improved living conditions on extremely poor reservations. The Depression devastated Mexican-Americans, 400,000 of whom returned to Mexico when demand for their labor declined. Some were coerced into moving by authorities in the Southwest, 
and perhaps 200,000 Mexican-American children who were born in the United States and were thus U.S. citizens were also pressured to move to Mexico. Those who stayed worked in desperate conditions on large corporate farms in the Southwest. The Wagner and Social Security Acts did not apply to agricultural workers, and when they tried to unionize, they were brutally suppressed. Mexican-American leaders tried to develop a strategy to claim rights as white Americans, but they also sought support from the Mexican government and promoted a mystical sense of pride and identification with Mexican heritage, later given the name La Raza. Always last hired and first fired, African Americans suffered the most in the Depression. Blacks who kept their jobs now competed with unemployed whites. Facing an unemployment rate twice that of whites, blacks benefited less from direct government relief and public works projects. The Depression forced blacks to make economic survival their primary demand. Even W.E.B. Du Bois surrendered his hopes for racial integration and urged blacks to think of themselves as a nation within a nation. He urged blacks to build an independent, cooperative economy with their own communities and take control of separate schools. While Roosevelt seemed little interested in race relations or civil rights, he appointed Mary McLeod Bethune, a well-known black educator, as his advisor on minority affairs and other blacks to positions. Key members of his administration included his wife and Secretary of the Interior, Harold Ickes, criticized segregation, disenfranchisement, and lynching. Blacks generally supported the New Deal and started voting for the Democratic Party, shifting away from their traditional support for Republicans. Their hopes for broader changes were stymied by white Southern Democrats' influence in the party. Federal housing policy powerfully reinforced residential segregations and showed the limitations of New Deal freedom. Local officials implemented national housing policy in ways that reinforced existing racial discrimination. Nearly all municipalities in both North and South insisted that housing sponsored by the federal government be racially segregated. The Federal Housing Administration also ensured mortgages that contained clauses barring future sale to non-whites. Federal employment practices also engaged in racial discrimination. In the federal government, few blacks held skilled or professional positions, and in the South, many New Deal construction progress refused to hire blacks. The New Deal's modernization of southern agricultural led large landowners to displace tenant farmers, many of whom were blacks, from their lands. Only with the Great Society programs of the 1960s was the welfare state extended in ways to fully incorporate black Americans. <laughs>